Good morning. On behalf of the Seattle Human Services Department and the Seattle Public Library, I'd like to welcome you to today's virtual event. My name is Lenny Orlov, and I will be your Russian interpreter this morning. Устраивайтесь поудобнее и подключайте субтитры. No, actually, your interpretation to Russian, as well as Arabic, Chinese, Korean, Spanish, and Vietnamese, is provided automatically through closed captioning, which is available during the live stream and if you're watching this program on YouTube. Please take a minute to click on the CC under the video and then on the gear on the right uh, to select one of these languages or English. Which one did you select? Go ahead and leave us a comment, even if it's English or none of the above. All right, so throughout today's program, we want you to go ahead and ask us any question you're interested in um, learning about. Our moderators, Michael Taylor Judd and Harrison Lee, will collect your input and pass it along to the presenters, either live in the virtual studio or via email. If you are joining the live event by phone, please hold your questions until we unmute your line. And with any questions related to aging or disability, you can always call 1-844-348-5464 and speak to a Community Living Connections Advocate. They'll help you connect with services and resources such as food and meals. Services are professional, confidential, and most are free of charge. Again, that number is 1-844-348-5464. You may also visit them on the web at communitylivingconnections.org to see the list of participating organizations in this network and to learn more about the full range of services. Again, communitylivingconnections.org. So, what are these age-friendly Seattle virtual events? They're one of the ways we're helping folks stay connected to and be informed about community and government resources. We got something for you every Thursday at 1030 AM. Well, almost. The months that happen to have five Thursdays like this month, we don't offer a regular Thursday program. But during that week, we just might hold a special event like the LGBTQ and Two-Spirit panel on COVID-19 resilience on Friday, July 31st at 1 p.m. You'll see that there's also a presentation by our Pearls counselors coming up on Tuesday, the 11th of August at 10.30 a.m. All other Thursdays feature close to home stories of health, tech, and resilience. And every one of our online programs is accessible from the same virtual event hub, which can be found at bit.ly forward slash age friendly live, which actually includes all previous episodes that you can check out. We hope that you'll stop by on July 23rd and then you'll be in for a treat. Northwest ADA Center Director Michael Richardson will kick off the 30th anniversary of the signing of Americans with Disabilities Act by describing how his organization is navigating the pandemic. George Dix, geriatric mental health specialist at Harborview Medical Center, will follow it up with a presentation on resilience. By the way, we are very, very lucky because George has also agreed to participate in that July 31st panel that I just mentioned a minute ago. So please mark your calendars, bookmark on your computer bit.ly forward slash hfriendlylive, which by the way is case sensitive if you're typing it into the browser, and tell a friend or anyone you consider to be close to home. But today, is all about the coffee. 
and civic participation in government decision making. Unlike the brand new Close to Home show that started this year, and some of our special events that feature almost exclusively community members, the Coffee Hour has been a forum for all the adults to interface with government leaders, and it's been going on for over a decade. The aim has been not only to provide information, but to receive feedback and answer questions. So please go ahead and leave us a comment right now with anything you'd like to say to Kathy Knight or June Michelle, who are with Aging and Disability Services, which is the Area Agency on Aging for Seattle and King County. We'll be hearing from Kathy and June in just a minute after a word from our partner, the Seattle Public Library. Nancy Sloat is SPL's Older Adults Program Manager and at Age Friendly Seattle, we very much appreciate her partnership. Starting in 2020, Nancy helped us relocate the coffee hours to the central branch in downtown Seattle and arrange for professional sound amplification. Even before COVID-19, our collaboration with SPL included an innovative component, which was our social media live streaming and plans for community screenings throughout Seattle. We do hope to revisit these ideas soon but for now, we'll continue working together on offering the Civic Coffee Hours virtually. Please welcome Nancy as she offers a brief update on what the library is doing to help folks stay connected. Nancy, thank you so much for being here today. It's great to have you as always. You're live on the show, so please unmute your microphone. Um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Lenny. I'm Nancy Sloat, and I'm very glad to be here today to uh, let you know what's happening at the library. And I first just want to let Lenny and Age Friendly and Aging and Disability Services also know how much we appreciate working with you to um, on all kinds of projects, including these coffee hours. So I know that everybody really wants to know when the library is going to open again, actually. Um, so this week, we are testing um, book returns at a few selected branches to make sure that we have a good process for getting all of those books and DVDs and other materials that people have checked out over the last, you know, prior to the last four months. We have over 400,000 items that are checked out and we have to have a good system for getting them back into the right branches. So we are testing the model this week and we will be adding other branches where people can return their materials. And then we hope um, by the end of July, that um, we will be able to have a system for what we call curbside pickup of all the holds that people had placed prior to the um, closure. Meanwhile, could I have the next slide, please? Meanwhile, the library really is open even though the buildings are physically closed to the public. And we still have many ways to reach the, the library and to ask questions. And of course, there's the phone, the trusty old phone and our quick information. And you can see the number up there, 386-4636. We have people on those phones um, from 10 until eight at night, um, Monday through Thursday and other hours on the weekends and on Friday, if you like, using your computer to ask questions, you can email us or even you can chat live with a librarian, um, which is sometimes also a very quick way to get an answer. Um, could I have the next slide? Um, I think what I've heard most from my friends and other people is that everybody loves all of the digital resources and materials that the library has. I don't think I could have gotten through the last four months without our amazing ebook collection where you can download an ebook onto your device, or if you prefer to listen to a book, we call it e audio. 
We also have so many great streaming services. Um, Canopy, which is showing up here on the screen, is streaming movies. Um, Freegal, also up here on the screen, is streaming music. And one that I also really love are our digital magazines, where it's just like reading the actual magazine, where you can turn pages and you see all the ads. It's about 100 titles that are really, really popular. Um, if you have any questions about how to use any of these streaming services or how to download a book, again, just call us at the library or email us. Uh, could I have the next slide? Now, you do need a library card and your PIN number to use all of these digital collections, but if you don't have one, get in touch with the library and we figured out an easy way for you to get a card. Next, um, next slide, please. All right, what's going on this summer? We have many, many programs for kids and adults this summer, and I just wanted to highlight a few of them. We've taken many in-person classes and we've made them virtual. So the first program, could I have the next slide, is coming up right this afternoon at one o'clock. We're partnering with the Washington Poison Center to do a class on how to keep all those cleaners and sanitizers in your house that we've been bringing in right over the last four months. Safety tips on how to keep them safe, um, how to get rid of them, how to identify them. So I'm really eager to do this class because I have so many bottles of cleaners in my house and I don't know what to do with them all. Next slide, please. We have also um, had all summer long a wonderful art series with Silver Kite, which is a community arts organization. It's a really fun, um, no pressure arts classes. Um, they're an hour long. I'm painting and drawing all for beginners or anybody who just wants to have fun for an hour. Um, visual journaling is one of my favorite ones. Uh, Lenny, could I have the next slide? We also have for all the book lovers, we have book bingo again this summer. And this is just, it's going all the way through Labor Day. And we have 25 categories of books and you read titles which fit those categories and try to get a bingo or try to fill in all of the different categories. One of my favorite is um, Animal as a uh, main character. So I'm still looking for a title for that. You can just go to our website and download this bingo card and all the instructions are right there. And then my final slide, the final, um, a uh, program that I wanted to talk about is we do have a number of programs talking about Medicare. So for anybody who is changing your plan and wants to change it in October, which is the open enrollment period, October and November, um, or if you're enrolling in Medicare for the first time, it can be very confusing. And we have a program, um, we have several programs which have a great introduction to Medicare. And with that, um, that's just a few, those are just a few of the programs that we have going. So my final slide will give you the way, the address to go to, um, to find all of our um, programs that are um, oriented to those of us who are older adults, 50 plus. So thank you for giving me some time to talk about our wonderful programs and I'm happy at the end to answer any other questions about the library. Thanks, Lenny. And uh, thank you, Nancy, for, for this update. I'm always impressed uh, over the past, you know, a couple of months that we've been doing virtual events um, and specifically the coffee hours. I'm always impressed with what the library has been doing, even while the branches are physically closed. And it sounds like you're uh, making some moves towards reopening, which is, which is, which is cool. We'll see how that goes. Um, you know, 
this is something that we usually talk about uh, on our weekly programs uh, is what does the State Department of Health recommend? And, and um, coronavirus cases are surging around the US and some parts of Washington. So the State's Department of Health does want to, to uh, remind you that stay home is still safest. Um, and, and they encourage folks to, you know, if, if you need to go out, uh, do wear a face covering uh, and maintain social distancing and, and keep, keep your hands clean. Uh, they are also urging anyone that thinks they may have COVID-19 symptoms to get tested. This here is a screenshot uh, from their website, coronavirus.wa.gov which links to pandemic resources in 10 languages, Chinese, English, Japanese, Korean, Punjabi, Russian, Somali, Spanish, Ukrainian, and Vietnamese. So a few more languages than we offer actually. Uh, there's also a health assistance hotline, which is at 1-800-525-0127. Please do keep checking this resource, coronavirus, Dot wa dot gov for updates. Uh, if you have any questions, you can also call them 1-800-525-0127. So how is the Area Agency on Aging responding to COVID-19? And what are the origins and the functions of the AAA? Um, Earlier in the program, we talked about age-friendly Seattle, whose goal it is to make this city a better place to grow up and grow old. Age-friendly Seattle's weekly virtual events are only a small part of our pandemic response. And we're grateful for your participation today. We want to encourage you to actively engage civically with us. So please keep posting your comments, questions, and other feedback. I did see that there's been questions in there that came through uh, that uh, seem to be related to general work of uh, city services and uh, transportation, et cetera. Let's see if some of these questions might be answered um, in the presentation that's coming up right now. Uh, and if not, we will be sure to pass them along to the responsible parties. But whether you're watching the show live or um, you're watching it on YouTube, we really would love to see what is it that you want to ask Kathy Knight and June Michelle. So now it's my pleasure to present uh, Kathy Knight. Kathy is the Director of Aging and Disability Services, which is a division of the Seattle Human Services Department. The division is recognized by the state and federal governments as the Area Agency on Aging for Seattle and King County. Kathy will tell you more about that. Kathy has directed our agency since late May 2017. Previously, she was State Director for the Washington Association of Area Agencies on Aging, W4A. For 11 years, she coordinated policy and legislative advocacy on behalf of area agencies on aging across the state. Kathy has worked with the Aging Network in Washington State in one capacity or another since 1990. Prior to that, she staffed the Wisconsin Council for Developmental Disabilities and later directed the ARC of Dane County, Wisconsin. Kathy grew up in Southern Ohio and completed her master's degree in education from the Ohio State University in Columbus. She earned a PhD in Behavioral Disabilities Studies at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Exactly a year ago, Dr. Knight was a guest on the age-friendly Seattle Civic Coffee Hour back when it was still in the downtown location. Welcome back to the coffee hour, Kathy. It's great to always have you back. Uh, you are now live on the Civic Coffee Hour. 
Thank you, Lenny. I'm just assuming you can hear me. Yes, we can. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> uh, I, I, I have to apologize. I still have to get used to working virtually. Um, I'm not, I'm not a digital native like my sons are. I'm one of those digital immigrants. And so it's like I like right now I see a little screen and I do see a picture of June and myself. So I think I'm good to go. And um, I just want to say hi to everyone. Thanks. Thanks for having me back. It's really wonderful to be here. I did participate in a one of our coffee hours last year, but this is my first online virtual experience at a coffee hour so bear with me so uh, and i i just have to say lenny's done a wonderful job of creating opportunities for people to connect from home and that's both with the the civic coffee hour that we have each month like today and and the newer close to home series that um lenny hosts uh, um on all the other thursdays so thank you so much lenny for these connections are so important for people nowadays especially when we're struggling with social isolation and um, staying home and staying safe. So what I'm going to do is uh, tell you just a little bit about aging and disability services, um, a little background so we're all at the same place, um, and then spend a little more time talking about advocacy uh, for the people we serve. And the, the folks we serve are primarily older people and when the program started, that was basically 60 and over. Uh, includes adults with disabilities, caregivers, and, and their families. So in a few minutes, I'm also going to introduce you to June Michelle. She serves on our Seattle King County Advisory Council for Aging and Disability Services, and she chairs our advocacy committee. So the two of us are going to share what we see as some of the major policy and funding issues that are facing the aging network now and in the near future. But I'll start with just talking about what an area agency on aging is, because that's aging and disability services is also an area agency on aging. And I do think that um, I go to the next slide. Is that somebody? I, I don't see slides advancing, so you have to tell me if they are. OK, that's a little background. Yes. Um, so that there you see aging and disability services. Which is in the human services department. Um, let's go to the next slide then. In terms of what an area agency on aging is. Area agencies on aging um, were established nationally in 1973. So we've been around for a long time. Um, they were authorized at, in one of the later amendments of the Older Americans Act. Older Americans Act was actually passed in 1965 this week, actually on Tuesday. So 55 years ago this week, um, the Older Americans Act was passed. So it, it's, it's um, been the foundation for uh, addressing the needs of older adults for a long time. And then with the area agencies coming on board in 1973, they play a very important role. Right now we have over, over 620 area agencies around this U.S. Uh, for short, we call them AAAs because it's a lot to say area agency on aging. We're not the AAA you call for a flat tire, but if your mom needs a home delivered meals, we're the ones to call. Um, AAAs were designed uh, to be on the ground organizations that are charged with helping vulnerable older adults live with independence and dignity, and that's within their own community. So we all want to stay at home as long as possible if we can, and that was sort of the basis of the original legislation. So AAAs advocate, plan, coordinate, and deliver services for older adults caregivers and people with disabilities and we play a key role in a wide range of long-term services and supports. So let's go to the next slide. States vary in um, <clears throat> The states determine the number of AAAs they want they establish that is um, authorized under the law and you'll find that we are in very size and scope. And in the state of Washington, we uh, our state 
unit on aging decided to divide up the state into 13 area agencies on aging, two of which are tribal. And then so the other 11 really served uh, all of the 39 counties. And so in some states that are pretty small or have small populations, you may only have one area agency on aging. But in our state, um, because of the size of the population, which is some of the basis for how the area agencies are divided up, you'll see that some serve single counties. And we, King County, Aging and Disability Services serves King County. Uh, but that's about 25% of the state's population of people who need long-term supports. So it's one county that serves a lot of people. How about going to the next slide? Okay. One of the requirements under the Older Americans Act and the role that area agencies play is um, um, having an advisory council. So the work we do as the Area Agency on Aging is guided by a 21 member advisory council that's appointed by both King County and City of Seattle policymakers. And there's a great picture of our current membership. It's a volunteer citizen body mandated by the Older Americans Act. Uh, our agency, the Seattle Human Services Department, acts as the legal contracting authority for the Area Agency on Aging. But we have an interlocal agreement between the City of Seattle and King County um, in a partnership uh, and work together with policy setting in terms of how we serve the entire county. And part of King County includes not just the division of community of health and community services, but also public health, Seattle King County Public Health. So that relationship has been um, very important, especially now during COVID um, and, and the need to respond to that and be prepared for that. And I think I misstated, it's the King County Department of Community and Human Services. I don't wanna get that wrong since they're one of our important partners. <laughs> um, how about if we go to the next slide? So let's look at who um, our, who ADS and all of the area agencies on aging around the state serve. People are surprised to know that we also serve younger people. So the original authorizing legislation definitely focused on folks 60 years of age and older, but over the years, the legislation has evolved as our role has evolved. And we also provide support to younger people who are caregivers and to people who are eligible for Medicaid long-term care benefits if they're 18, 18 years of age and older. So that's a pretty broad age range of folks that we're serving right now through that program. We do have priorities that are established in the legislation and um, to, are prioritized to outreach to people who typically have less access to care. So that includes ethnic or cultural minorities, limited English proficiency individuals, low income individuals with poor health, uh, rural residents and, and folks who are socially isolated. And this is, you could see from the map in some areas of the state, that's definitely um, a large number of folks they serve. And individuals who are at risk for institutionalization. So that encompasses quite a few different um, groups and in particular in King County that makes our the population we serve very diverse. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so last year ADS, Aging and Disability Services, served more than 49,000 individuals and that's an unduplicated count. So that means that some were served once Others might have benefited from multiple programs and services. We do provide some direct services. Um, mostly we contract out for the services we provide in the community. We hold approximately 170 contracts with 80 different community agencies that are key partners for us in serving the needs of individual, more vulnerable individuals and older adults. To do this work, we depend heavily on state and federal funds. And um, that means our clients depend on those funds too. And June's gonna talk a lot about the significance of that later. 
So this slide lists some of our core programs and services. One of our largest programs is our uh, case management program. We serve a, a number of individuals through that. Um, we have uh, a regular monthly clientele of over 12,000 just in our Medicaid Title 19. And if you broaden our role, we're looking at you know over 16,000 individuals and our nutrition program, 15, over 15,000 and information assistance. We're looking at over 14,000 individuals that get served in those programs. And so you can see there that there are a number of different services that are available through the area agency. And some of those again are mandated under our um, original legislation and some, some in response to local needs, which is one of the key things that's um, important to remember about area agencies on aging because of that local focus we can respond to the local needs of our community let's go to the next slide so COVID work we do is so important and has been for over 50 years and then we just realized more so how important the role of the area agencies are when the COVID-19 um, pandemic hit our area um, in early March. Had a big impact on, on the communities we serve as it has had on all of us, on all of our lives. One of the things we had to do is very many of our services in order to continue to serve individuals, uh, we needed to do more remote, um, digital, sort of like what we're doing today. Many of our activities, we had to switch to virtual opportunities. And so we have many individuals in the community who are pretty frail being served by our case management program. And that included uh, the social workers coming in at least once a year and doing assessments. Well, how can you do that when we're all staying home and trying to protect the health of very vulnerable people during this time. So we had to rely much more on phone calls and regular check-ins. One of the things our team did in April, which was an amazing feat that they accomplished, uh, reached out to about 14,000 of our clients and had conversations with every one of them just to make sure they were doing okay, finding out what they needed, what kind of help if they needed additional food, medical attention, uh, social connections. So that was a big, big effort that was done in the month of April by our case management team. Our meal programs, we have I think about 56 sites uh, around the county that serve congregate meals. That means folks come in and they get to have a lunch with their friends and socialize with other individuals. And all of those programs, of course, had to close down and are still closed down, but they switched very quickly. Um, we have 51 sites now that are preparing, still preparing meals and delivering meals um, around the county. Uh, and this is in addition to our regular home delivered Meals on Wheels program that's been in existence for years. We also increased services to those individuals. And through, the, through close collaboration with our public health department and others, we developed guidelines for our entire network of providers to help direct them in their work. At all of our meetings now, um, just like this one, we're doing it virtually and we're, we're kind of learning how to do it that way. I, I give a lot of credit to all of my advisory council members who have figured it out. We have regular monthly meetings and so we're, we're just learning and we are learning uh, as, as our uh, agency with our staff how to really function and continue doing our work so that um, it doesn't change even though we have this crisis to deal with. So, so things are happening daily and weekly and we have lots of different things we're doing to help people stay connected and we have information that's available in multiple languages more so than ever and Lenny's, Lenny sort of made that apparent in talking about the different languages for today's program. So I think that's enough about me. I want to bring in June Michelle now because um, she's 
she's my sidekick on this whole project and one of our best advocates um, for aging and disability services. Uh, June's, a, and you might want to go to the next slide. I think you might get to see a picture of her with me. There you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> June is a civil rights attorney who's invested her career in advocating for women's rights, employment equality, and a better future for older adults. She's now licensed, well, she's been licensed to practice law in California for a long time and more recently been licensed in Washington State. That's very exciting. She serves on the boards of the SHAG Community Life Foundation and the People's Memorial Association. June writes a weekly column about issues of interest to older people in the Northwest Facts newspaper. As the advocacy chair for the Seattle King County Advisory Council for Aging and Disability Services, June collaborates on strategies to build and maintain support in Washington, D.C. and Olympia and right here in the city of Seattle and with our suburban cities. So we're very lucky to have her um, not only for her expertise, but for her passion about aging issues. So with all that said, I'm going to turn it over to you, June. <laughs> Thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, I, it's a pleasure to be here. And that's a wonderful way to kick off because if we're going to discuss advocacy, personally, I don't think you can be an advocate unless you have a passion about something. All those people that are currently marching in the streets across the United States, that's advocacy. They're out there, they have a passion, they have, they have a wrong they want to right, and that's advocacy. And advocacy can be out in the streets. Advocacy can be what we do in the advocacy committee. We, as you, this picture here, we went to Washington, D.C. and said that was, that picture was taken when they were planning to cut off the food stamp program, which would have uh, or, or a great portion of the food stamp program, which would have had thousands of people in and around uh, Washington going without food and their children starving. And we went and advocated. So that's that tells you what we do now. Where where does this this process or this um, need to to go and put our noses face to face with our uh, elected officials. Where does that come from in the United States? It is in our First Amendment. The First Amendment gives the people the right to petition the government and to redress grievances, and that cannot be taken away from us. It gives us the right when we feel something has gone terribly wrong, or if we just think it's somewhat wrong, it gives us the right and in fact, it's our responsibility to go to our elected officials and keep them aware of what is what is needed in the society. Hopefully we can make those statements long before it requires thousands of people to be out in the street during a pandemic. But but nonetheless, that is our duty. And and I, I think at one point or another, everyone has been an advocate for something. You will think back in your life and think of the time that you said, that is just not right. And then you took action. Okay, you became an advocate at that moment. I looked it up on Wikipedia to see what, what Wikipedia thinks advocacy is. And it says, advocacy is an activity by an individual or group that aims to influence decisions within political, economic, or social institutions. Okay, let me tell you what we're working on just this month, just these last few weeks in the Advocacy Committee of the Aging Disability Services Advisory Council. We, as you know, the pandemic has with it has been a tremendous uh, cost to keep or try to keep Americans safe and healthy. That cost has now led us into a recession of sorts. And the recession, since we start out with a balanced budget, and we're very good at making that happen, 
But if you start out with a balanced budget and then you take a major hit, which we just did, uh, then you have to make that up somewhere. So all departments across the, the state of Washington have been asked to make cuts in their programming and their in their departments. Uh, for the most part, it's been 15% because ADS, Aging Disability Services, what they do is life-saving programs. That's what they do. They make sure people who can cannot count their own pills or if they get it wrong, they would have a seizure. They send a person out there to do that. They make sure the, the little senior who is isolated, who has no food, gets nutrition. They make sure that the person who fell and cannot get up and that has no relatives, they make sure that person is taken care of. These are life saving programs. OK, but ADS is part of the entire state of Washington and they have to make 10 percent cuts. How who decides what 10 percent life saving program should be cut? How would you like to be in that position, which is where Kathy finds herself right now? Our concern, obviously, in advocacy is how do we keep ADS from losing much needed funds that are keeping people alive? And are there alternate funding resources? We don't have the answer to that yet. We just posed the question. Oh, look, here we have a budget <laughs> like magic, a budget deficit. Um, so it could lead to a 20, $220 million cut in services for long care. OK, long term services and support. Um, I have to say that doesn't mean a whole lot to everybody. Let me explain that, because most of us, when we think of long term care, we think of the insurance that you buy so that when you're older and or you need or you need long term care, you can be in a facility. And that is the the classic definition and, and hence the name of the insurance long term care. OK, but in Washington, we are number one in as the state in the United States that has taken long term care and put it together with the, the needs and the wishes of the people. Most people do not want to spend their last days in a facility among strangers. Most people want to age and in place. They want to live and die in their own home, if at all possible. But if you don't have a team of people who will see you through that, as we were speaking about a moment ago, who would bring you food, who would help you with manage your health care, if you don't have that team, it's almost impossible. Washington State took the lead in transforming long term care into look at this. I am just a genius uh, transforming long term care into the ability to stay in your own home. Uh, OK, so there we are Mark, there in we are this new slide shows that we are ranked number one in Washington. Uh, and we work really hard to make that happen. If you now here we are, we have we have made the commitment to the people of Washington. We are here for you. We will help you age safely in your own home. And now here we are facing a 10 percent cut in our ability to do so. This is advocacy. This is advocacy 101. If you have a loved one, if you have a neighbor who now they are facing these choices, they they are as there are not that many convalescent home beds available. Uh, right now, convalescent homes are not a real exciting place for seniors to check into because uh, that's where the great number of senior deaths has occurred uh, because of coronavirus. So seniors want to stay in their home. This is an advocacy issue. How can you help? You can help. Everyone listening can help by 
calling or writing to your senators, your state senators, uh, your local uh, legislative bodies. Uh, look at this and you can write to your elected officials and you and this is how do you know who your elected leaders are? Here's this book and there's the link right there. Uh, that that is www.seattlewb.org forward slash try dash directory dot html. OK, so you write to your elected officials and you ask them. It doesn't have to be lengthy. You don't have to be scholarly. You can just speak from the heart and say, please don't cut the ADS funds for long term care. My mother will die if you do that. I mean, just that's it. You just said it and you sign your name. They uh, we use a term that is probably new to many of you. It's called constituents. A constituent is a person who resides within the district that that elected official is responsible for. So they really love to hear from their constituents. If, so use this uh, this site here, this uh, link. Understand who your elected official or your district is and your voice will have that much more power. That's advocacy. You are now an advocate for your long term care of your relatives, of just of the of your neighbors. Um, and you would make such a difference. You are also invited. I am the chair of the advocacy committee at ADS. We meet on the second Friday of every month, uh, and we are now doing it virtually uh, via Zoom, so we make it very easy. You're, in, you're invited to join us. This coming month will be a little bit off, off what we usually do. What we usually do so check with us in September. What we usually do is we have dynamite members on the advice, advisory council advocacy committee representing uh, the black community, the people in poverty, um, uh, LGBT. Um, I'm thinking I'm going around the table. Um, homelessness. Um, it, it, we just have uh, people with disabilities and we get together and we are known as the the eyes and the ears of the advisory council and we bring them from our backgrounds. We bring them the current needs within the community. OK, so here we have how can you help with the um, COVID? Now, you know, COVID-19 that is coronavirus. OK, so you can share your story if you are having some difficulty or if you know of somebody who has, you can share your story by calling this phone number. That's 1-888-380-4650. And by sharing your story, we in, in the county and in the city become aware of specific needs and then we can we can impact on those needs. And again, you call that number with your specific story and you are now an advocate. That's advocacy. I've been an advocate all my life. Um, practically, I, I, my first job out of law school was with the as a lawyer with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. That's federal commission and they're charged with maintaining equality for women and minorities and at that and people uh, who are seniors in employment. So I've been fighting for people since I got out of law school and now I'm a lawyer in California where I had my own law firm, lawyer in Washington and I'm still battling. But with this is a big one, guys. We 10% of loss of life saving programs if you don't have to be a wizard to say people are going to die. OK, so this is really big, so we want to deal with this. The coronavirus has had other impacts on seniors. We'll deal specifically with seniors. Um, seniors contract 
coronavirus at a rate of a percentage rate of the total of about 13 to 20 percent. But seniors die of the virus at a rate of about 70 percent. So now put that in right next to people under 30 contract the coronavirus at a rate of 30, 25 to 30 percent, but they die at a rate of 7 percent. You see? So seniors get coronavirus and they die very, not only do they die, but they can die very rapidly if they have under what we call underlying health concerns like heart, heart issues or diabetes or stroke issues. They then they can go in four days. OK, back to if seniors are dying or can die in four days time and we're cutting programs by 10 percent. OK, we're advocates here. I'm turning you all into little advocates because we every voice counts. Every individual voice counts, every constituent voice counts. And if you get two of you together, if you go to your community uh, center and you put your voice together with someone else there, that's more powerful. If you go to your house of worship and you put your voice together with the people there, that's more powerful. If you just turn around to the people that you're working with or, or if you just the people you there are zoom chat rooms what would happen if every zoom chat room got together and everybody there contacted their local officials and said do not cut public services to long-term care okay do not cut the funding to long-term term care that's the uh long-term care is a major major issue okay Kath, I think Kathy is my little uh, angel behind all of these slides that I'm magically producing here. Uh, Kathy would like to inform us that we can make things happen if we, in fact, vote during the general election. You know, I have on the advocacy committee one of the people I really lean on. She is incredible. She was a license, fully licensed uh, dentist here in Washington state and she became aware that many of the people that came into her were dealing with infections in other parts of their body and it, that they needed neuro neurological care and so she went back to school and became a neurologist. She's incredible and I, her brain is so important to everything we do in advocacy. She just announced that she is leaving the United States. She happens to have dual citizenship in Canada. She is leaving the United States because she does not like the way the country is going and she's returning to Canada. We cannot have a brain drain like that. So again, vote in November. If you are unhappy with the way things are going, vote in November. I've heard so many people say, well, I didn't vote in that election because I just didn't like the person who was running. Come on, vote in November. We cannot go another four years this way. Uh, have you noticed we're kind of going downhill? Um, we cannot do it again. Uh, we just, okay, let's talk about advocacy. We just uh, had a policy come out of Washington, D.C. that uh, from now on uh, the hospitals in care homes around the states of all states, the United States, no longer send their data to the CDC for tracking, but now they send it to a individual department that Trump has set up the that in Washington, D.C., and it will all go there uh, instead. Now, that's a little concerning to some people, uh, and you have to it's tough to be an advocate. You have to keep aware. You have to know what's going on. And what if you didn't register to vote and something came up that you really did care about, but you had squandered your voice, okay? I'm going to leave you with do not squander your voice. Like they say in Hamilton, don't lose your shot. Come on, we have to make every single voice count. Support long-term care. Avoid cuts to long-term care, vote in November, become an advocate. That's me. Okay, Kathy. Thank you, June. 
This is Lenny. Um, I want to go right into questions because we have quite a few. I'm going to turn it over to Harrison for that, whose picture you saw earlier uh, in the presentation. Uh, Harrison, um, what do we have? Maybe we have time for maybe the top two or three questions that we can pose to Kathy and June. OK, sounds good. Um, let's see here. We have quite a few questions, so I'll, go, I'll try to see. Probably just go down the list here. Um, so let's see here. The first question I have is, um, how is the city and county expanding technology access and training for seniors? Oh, that's a really good question. You know, um, and we just are seeing what a need it is. Certainly within the city, I think actually we have a city council member who wants to propose something that will uh, make techno um, internet uh, more available to citizens and I think the county recognizes the need we just we've been getting requests we're looking at how uh, we can do more for because we really you know if you talk about equity issues that's a big one we need to make sure that everybody has equal access to the ability to participate in meetings like this and to get information in this way so um, I know there is at the city, there's a, a real interest in looking at that now, but I think that's something, again, that's our role as an area agency on aging is we're seeing, people weren't thinking about this to the degree we are now before COVID. We knew it was a problem around the country and folks in rural areas just didn't have the same access, but now it's, it's like, it's the difference between life and death for some people and with telehealth and all that. So we've got to, we've got to do more there. It's an important issue. I would like to throw in and thank the library uh, because it has been phenomenal but uh, asset for me. I'm a reader, I read constantly, and I just download those ebooks right to my little Kindle. I whip through the book, I send it back in within four days and I'm on to the next book. It, and that's technology that was not available that I've heard from so many seniors that they so appreciate. And as Kathy said, seniors have had to who are not contemplating Zooming at all. Seniors around the United States are now on Zoom. They're playing, they're playing games together. They are visiting family together. They are celebrating uh, uh, celebrations, holidays together with their family via Zoom. So there you have it. Great, Next. thanks. Um, let's see, let's go to the next question we have here. Uh, this one says, uh, what additional support or guidance from aging slash disability is most helpful at this time for the communities and organizations? Sorry, could you say that again, Harrison? Yeah, it says, um, what additional support or guidance from aging and disabilities is most helpful at this time for the communities and organizations? Um, well, I think that certainly the fact that we are right in step with public health and all of the guidelines. I mean, I think that um, we're struggling so much with uh, people dealing with COVID and I think that we have to re reinforce and encourage people we have to continue on this course. We need to be following the guidelines. We need to get through this um, pandemic. So that's an important part of the role that we play about, you know, reminding people the importance of staying safe. And our job is to help um, the community know that we do have resources to help individuals. We can deliver meals. We can provide some resources and social connections like June was talking about. Um, and with our agencies, one of the things that we've been lucky about is we did receive federal stimulus dollars um, and there are more coming, we hope, soon. And that has gone to support our community agencies who have struggled to continue to provide services during the COVID pandemic and have had to shift the way they do services. So it's important that we be a good partner with our our community agencies, that we be a strong voice to the community um, to stay the course 
and really protect ourselves. We don't want more people getting COVID. We're right at um, 11.30 now. Uh, I, let, let me uh, maybe uh, slide one more question in and then we'll see if our presenters have time to stick around a little bit longer. The question is how to become a member of aging and disability. I think they're referring to the advisory council. Who would like to take that? Kathy. Well, there's a process and, and um, we encourage people to apply. Um, if you're really interested, we are always looking for, we have just such a great uh, council and it takes people who are active and interested and wanting to be involved. If um, we could, how can we get that information to people, Lenny? Can we tell them to contact you because they, they are connected with you and we can explain the process? because we have, uh, there's a whole, like I said, a whole application process. Depending yeah, on whether yeah. you're a city, whether you live in the city of Seattle or, or in King County, because it's a, an act, a decision that's actually made by the different count, uh, city and county councils. So I think if they contact you, we can get them that information. Okay. Uh, so, um, right, so let's see. Uh, that's fine. Uh, one way to get it, if you have my email address, that's great. But uh, the best way to get in touch with Age Friendly Seattle is to email agefriendly at seattle.gov. And then I can forward it on to um, to Kathy uh, to, to take a look. Um, so we are out of time. Uh, do uh, our guests have uh, a few more minutes to answer a few more questions today? Is that, is that OK? I Sure, sure. I have about 15 minutes. Okay, well, if, if folks yeah. have time to stick around, uh, I'm talking about our viewers and listeners today. Um, let's go uh, down the list of questions then. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Harrison. Thanks, Lenny. Um, let me see where I was. Um, all right, so... But another question here that says, what advocacy do you feel is important for older people? The silent majority at this time. What statistic do you have on this information in the communities? So I think it's kind of a two part question there, but. Okay, let's take it from the top. They, seniors are not necessarily your silent majority. When I go and lobby on behalf of, and Kathy, when we go and lobby on behalf of seniors, we immediately point out that statistically the group of people that votes most of any other demographic is seniors. Seniors are the ones who get to the polls. Seniors are the ones who read all the material, go through the pamphlet, they circle what they're, who they're voting for and how they feel and they get themselves to the polls or they send in their ballots. So seniors, I have great faith. And that's why I write an, a weekly article for seniors in the Facts newspaper, because I know I can download what's important right now and that seniors will jump on it. I'm So I have real faith in seniors. I don't, down, don't downplay the power of seniors. Seniors can make things happen. And I agree with June. That's very true. One of, that's one of the powerful messages we have when we visit legislators is we can say older adults vote. And so it's important to listen. I think the most important thing uh, people who are concerned now can do is uh, it's, a, it's a good time now to be letting both your state legislator legislators know as well as your congressional delegation how we need resources. We need we need more stimulus dollars to help support the state because all the states are going through major recessions right now. And we're hoping the Senate, we're hoping Congress will come back in session, I think next week and really deal with another stimulus package that will help the states tremendously. And then our state legislators, you know, um, June was talking about the severe cuts we're facing right now because of the recession. 
they need to know that uh, the devastating effects those will have. And we have excellent advocacy message, messaging that we could provide to anybody. I, I feel like the easiest thing to do, Lenny, is to keep directing them to maybe your age-friendly email address. Once we get a contact, we can send all that information so you know what kind of message to be giving um, both our state and federal legislators. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see here. Another question. It's uh, this question here says um, aging in poverty in Seattle is lack of information and resources. Or and it, then it asks, uh, what can you do and who do we see? Okay, let's let me deal with. Um, let me give you a couple of advocacy. Uh, forums for you. The ACLU, I would direct you to the ACLU. They have a, they are the ones who have been filing uh, cases on behalf of the protesters. They're defending the protesters that have been out in the streets. Uh, they have a whole section on their site for, and I sent in the link to ACLU. May, perhaps we can put it up at this point. Um, they are, uh, they have a whole section on COVID-19 and what to do with that. And they have Im an immigrants rights, uh, department. So I would suggest people go, I'm going to give you three things that could help in various areas. Okay. So ACLU is definitely, uh, that's the American civil liberties union. Then Seattle, uh, civil rights, uh, late, that is a, Group, Seattle Civil Rights and Labor History Project. Seattle Civil Rights and Labor and History. Lenny, do we have those links that I sent you that we could post for them perhaps? Uh, so that's the Seattle Civil Rights and Labor History Project. Go uh, do a search, come up with that. That gives you not only the local entities that are associations and, and groups that are there to help you, but their history and in here in Washington State. And then the last one I think is very important is the Washington State Bar. Uh, they have a whole program called the Moderate Means Program, and they will help people with family law, divorce issues, housing issues, uh, consumer law issues, which includes vehicle purchase or debt, uh, unemployment benefits, if you fail to receive your unemployment, ben unemployment um, benefits, they will help you with that. So that's three areas that will help you. Um, and hopefully, I did send in the sites. I, don't, we, I would love it if we put them up, but hey, do the search on those three. Go to the Washington State Bar Association look up the program across the top. It will say um, the moderate means program and they have coronavirus, they have unemployment, um, they have and they charge reduced fees. So the whole reason for the program is, is the attorneys doing it are doing it with vastly reduced fees just to help the, the public. And I want to put in a plug for our, our local community living connection service. I mean, that's your first place to go. Any aging or disability questions, issues, if it's you or a family member, um, we have a network of local community partners that help with this. And we have a, a, an information line and we have trained specialists who can help folks who are having issues and helping them navigate where to find resources. I don't know if that's something you usually put up at the coffee hour, Lenny, but it wouldn't be a bad idea. I'll just say the number, it's a toll-free number, 1-844-348-5464. They can help you get started. Any other questions? Thank you, Kathy. That's um, that's something that we always talk about on our virtual events, and I do have a slide, but I just want to make sure that we cover as many questions as we can. Um, June, thank you for those links. Um, I have the links. Uh, I'm, I'm perhaps because we are uh, over time, I'm no longer able to post those in the chat. 
Um, but uh, folks are welcome to um, get in touch with us uh, by uh, you know emailing the the address that I had um, earlier suggested. Um, also, uh, as you saw on on the slide that has the, the nice pictures of Kathy and June, um, there is um, the the general email address which we recommend that you use for uh, accessing aging disability services. Um, so uh, unless it's uh, directly related to Age Friendly Seattle, I would use this uh, more general email address, which is aginginfo at seattle.gov. Two words, aginginfo, together with no spaces or dots or underlinings, aginginfo at seattle.gov. Um, uh, maybe uh, let's uh, do one more question here, uh, Harrison. Uh, you you take a pick of which one, and maybe there was one question that was really really long. Maybe we do that one. What do you think? You know which one I'm talking about? Sorry, Lenny. I just think I just. Uh, had a little bit of an internet issue. I didn't quite catch what you were saying there. Uh, no worries. Uh, let me just, in the interest of time, I'll just go ahead and uh, read the question here. Um, so, um, let's see. No, I've lost it. Um, okay, so this question is from Rick. Uh, question or more of a comment. Uh, there's a gap between those who can fully take care of themselves uh, and their home where one is uh, in some sort of a facility. Those seniors needing some assistance in cleaning and taking care of their homes have no help. This can lead to unsanitary conditions, uh, trip and fall hazards, and some physical tasks that cannot be done. We have shopping and driving as help, but not in the home. So this is not a question, it's just a comment uh, that came through. Does anyone want to respond? Uh, I still think it's worthwhile calling that Community Living Connections number because we do have, right now we're in the middle of a demonstration waiver where we actually are providing some of those kinds of services to people who weren't previously eligible. It's, uh, it's sort of a Medicaid benefit that, that reaches people who are not quite yet Medicaid eligible, but I, I think there might be resources and it's important to reach out and ask and to ask specifically about though that kind of assistance there it may there's um also certainly for uh caregivers we have a state family caregiver support program and it's not a, a medicaid program so you don't have the income eligibility requirements that can provide support and i just think i don't know that enough people realize some of those resources are out there and it's worth checking into definitely All right, thank you, Kathy. I put that up on the screen now, the slide uh, with the Community Living Connections. Um, so um, there was also a transportation question, which uh, I would encourage you to uh, send to that uh, email address um, that was on the previous slide, which was, um, let's see, aginginfo at seattle.gov and we'll uh, forward it on to the right person. You know, we do have a, C a Seattle Department of Transportation, of course, that might be able to respond and we partner with Sound Transit and Community Transit. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, our panelists, uh, Kathy Knight and June Michelle. I also want to thank um, Harrison for, for being here uh, and facilitating. And um, uh, I want to thank Nancy Sloat uh, for your partnership with the Coffee Hours and for information and and uh, and what you know what support you provide to folks uh, during these difficult times. We hope that you enjoyed uh, being here with us today. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please uh, go ahead and uh, click the subscribe button and and the bell so that you know when when this Coffee Hour, which is turned into a little bit more than an hour uh, when it's uploaded 
to our channel and so you can let your uh, friends know uh, that they can watch all the episodes of the coffee hour of the close to home show uh, as well as special events right there on YouTube uh, and um, it, you you can always go to bit.ly forward slash H friendly live to see previous episodes or to join the, the current one and, and and on Thursday July 23rd we would love for you to, to come back and tell your friends uh, about the presentation with Michael Richardson and George Dix. Again, with any questions about aging or disability uh, related to, to, to food or to anything related to, to COVID really, um, or a leaky faucet or a rent support, really anything related to aging and disability, you can call 844-348-5464 or visit communitylivingconnections.org to find out if there is one near you that's beginning to reopen one of those organizations. Thank you so much for being here. Hopefully uh, you've uh, gone through uh, a, um, a hot beverage uh, or two by now, and we'll, we'll see you next month for another coffee hour uh, and every week for other digital virtual programming. Thank you, take care and have a good one. That was a lot of good information. Yeah, good job, Lenny.